In this talk, we will discuss one of the core component of the logic and computer design fundamental. Uh, we already introduced chapter two, part one. In chapter two, which talks about combination logic circuits, uh, we already uh, have uh, in, in part one, uh, the uh, fundamental uh, knowledge about logic gates and uh, how we uh, represent the logic function using uh, product of max terms or sum of min terms. In bar two, we will talk about circuit optimization. So in the uh, beginning of the course, we give an introduction about computers, and then we start representing numbers, both on positive and negative uh, forms. And after that, we also represent the characters. And then we move to logic gates and how we use primitive logic gates to build more complex gates. And then we talked about the uh, uh, gate circuits and Boolean equation. We checked the binary logic in gates, Boolean algebra, and the standard forms, meaning the uh, uh, product of uh, uh, max terms and the sum of min terms. Now we will focus in bar two uh, on, cir on circuit optimization. So we will check two level optimization, map manipulation and multi-level circuit optimization. Uh, the idea behind the circuit op optimization is try to get, to get a simple form to any uh, logic function. So when we try to design it or draw its logic diagram, uh, it's going to be in a simple form. So the circuit optimization goal is to obtain the simplest implementation for a given function. The optimization is a more formal approach to simplification that is performed using a specific procedure or algorithm. And we will check this algorithm in this talk. The optimization requires a cost uh, criterion to measure the simplicity of a circuit. So before we check the optimization, we will try to formulate a way to find the cost of a logic uh, circuit. Uh, two distinct cost criteria we will use in this class. The first one is the literal cost, L, and the second one is the gate input cost, G. The G has two variation. The gate input cost without inverters or nuts, that's symbol G, or the other one, which is the gate input cost with nuts, and that's the G N. The literal cost, uh, the, a literal is a variable or its complement. The literal cost is the number of letters appearances in a Boolean expression corresponding to the logic circuit diagram. So as an example, if you check those function, here we have F is equal to B, D, or A, B bar, C, or A, C bar, D bar. So you can count the letters. Even if they are repeated, you count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So L is equal to eight. Notice that I'm counting all the letters, whether they are in their normal form or their inversion form, even also if they are repeated, such as the A here. 
Another example here, the letters are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And you can count these and you will find that L is equal to 10. Now, if, if the, the, those three functions are equal, so you can uh, answer this question, which solution is best? By finding the L, you can check or you can say that the L cost here, the lateral cost is equal to eight. So this is the best design so far. Uh, the gate input cost uh, is the number of the inputs to the gates in the implementation corresponding exactly to the given equation or equations. G doesn't count the inverters, GN include the inverters. For the SOP or the POS equations, it can be found from the equations by finding the sum of the following, one, two, three. The first one, you get all the literal appearances, which we just found and we call it L. The second one is the number of terms excluding terms consisting only of a single letter. So if there is a term with a single letter, we don't include it. Other than that, we count the other terms. And by uh, finding this number, we add it to the L and we call it G. The third, optionally, the number of the distinct complemented single literals, which we call it a G, we call it G N. To explain this, we have the example, the same example that we described in this, uh, in the previous slide. So if you remember, we got L here is equal to eight and here 11 and here we have L is equal to 10. The same example again, but now we will find G and GN. So we got L here is equal to eight. We got L here is equal to 11. And we got L here is equal to 10. Now to get G, you add to L the number of uh, terms, excluding the terms that consist only of a single Letter. So right now we have three terms. So three plus eight is equal to 11. And to, if you want to get the GN, you add to the G. So basically G is equal to L plus three. So G here is equal to L plus those three. And G is, GN is equal to G, which is right now we have 11 plus you count the number of distinct complement single laterals, which means you found, we will try to find laterals with bar, but uh, you don't take repetition. So for example, here we have B bar and we have C bar and D bar. So there are three more, G plus three, 11 plus three, is equal to 14. In this case, the L was equal to 11. So the G is equal to 11 plus one, two, three, four terms. So it's going to be 15. And the GN will be 15 plus, now we count one, that's one inversion. We don't consider this, we already consider it. And two and three. So we have three. 15 plus 3 is equal to 18. For the last case, we have L is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So L is equal to 10. Uh, if you want to try to find G, it will be 10 plus the number of terms. Right now we have... Uh, uh, sums or product of sums. 
So we have one, two, three, and four. 10 plus four is equal to 14. If you want to find GN, then you include the bar without repetition. So we have one, two, and three. 14 plus three is 17. If you were asked which solution is, is the best and you want to consider the GN, so again, this function is the best so far. Now, if we take this example and we, you were asked to find LG and GN, for this simple example, the number of L is 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The G is equal to L plus how many terms? We have three terms, but this term has a single lateral, so we don't consider it. We have only two. So L plus two is equal to seven. For the GN, you include both inversion. So it will be G plus two. It's going to be equal to nine. So again, the literal count counts the AND inputs and a single literal or uh, input, uh, the G gate input adds the remaining OR gate inputs, and the GN uh, gate input counts with nuts add the inverter inputs, meaning you can see the blue dots in the circuit will be counting those inputs. So it's counting the add inputs, this AND inputs, and the single lateral OR input, which is this one. And the G, it's counting the, the remaining OR inputs. And the GN, it's adding the inverter inputs here. And this way, you get nine. If you count these dots, they will be nine. This is the cost criteria. Uh, as another example, uh, for example, if you have this function and we draw it here, L is equal to 6, G will be equal to 8, and GN is equal to 11, and you can check that. You have the same function, but we represent it as uh, the product of uh, sums and we generate this block diagram from this function. You can find that the gn is equal to 12. Now, this is the same function. And having the same literal cost, if you can see the L is the same. But first circuit has better gate input count and better gate input count with nuts. So this one is better in terms of G and GN, so we should select the uh, sum of uh, min terms in this case. They are min terms. So now the cost criteria is actually helping us decide which design is better. After we have this tool of measurement, now we can start doing the Boolean function optimization. So minimizing the gate input or lateral cost of a set of Boolean equation reduce the circuit cost. We choose the gate input cost as the metric for measuring which design is better. The Boolean algebra and graphical techniques are tools to minimize, minimize the cost criteria values. And we checked some example in the previous slide. Some important questions are the following. When do we stop trying to reduce the cost? Do we know when we have the minimum cost? Do we reach the minimum possible uh, representation of a certain function? So we treat the optimum or near optimum cost function for two level uh, SOP or POS circuit first. And then we will introduce a graphical technique that help us answer those two questions. It's called Carnot maps 
or in short, K maps. So a Carnot map, a K map is a collection of squares. Each square represents a min term. The collection of the square is a graphical representation of a Boolean function. And we organize them in kind of a table. There are certain conditions for this table. The adjacent square differ in the value of only one variable. Alternative algebraic expression for the same function are derived by recognizing patterns of the, these squares. The K-map can be viewed as a recognized version of the truth table. So it's actually the truth table, but it's, it's, it's drawn in a different way. A topological wrap uh, Venn diagram as, as used to visualize sets in algebra uh, in the algebra of sets. Some uses of the K-map it's provi providing me a mean for finding the optimum or the near optimum, uh, which is what we call the optimization. So you find the SOP and POS standard forms and the two level and an or, or uh, and or slash and circuit implementation for function with small number of variables. You visualize the concept related to manipulating Boolean expressions. And you also can demonstrate the concepts used by computer-aided design to help these tools simplify large circuits in an easy uh, way. Uh, for our needs in this class, the main objective of the K-map is to optimize the function to find the, simple, the simplest implementation of any Boolean function. So now we will try to define, or we will start defining the Carnot map for different number of inputs. So we will start with, start with two variables, and then we will move to three and four variables. The two variable map, a two variable Carnot map of the, this function, it has two input X and Y, uh, is drawn like this. You can see this is a truth table, for example, you fill the truth table and suppose that the, the 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 output of this function is a b c and b. could be zero or one so what you do in this Carnot map you draw it this way you can see it's like a table each square here can or represent a min term this is min term zero min term one min term two and min term three if you remember, min term zero is x bar y bar. Min term one is x bar y. Min term two is x y bar. And min term three is x y. Uh, now, the main property of the Carnot map is how these squares are adjacent to each other. So you can note that the m zero and m one M0 and M1, M0 and M2, M3 and M1, M3 and M2. They are adjacent. They are adjacent in this table. You can see that M0 and M3, they are not adjacent. Also, M1 and M2, they are not adjacent. So this is the two variable Carnot map. It's very simple. Uh, it's just for introduction or purpose only. And usually in, in like problems that needs uh, investigation and finding the simplest form of a certain function, uh, uh, three variable or four variable maps uh, are the main uh, Carnot maps that are used on uh, uh, more complex designs. So now uh, the K map is just a different form of the truth table. So if you have A, B, C, and D, you just write it here, A, B, C, and D. 
the two variable function, we choose A, B, C, and D from the set zero and one. So A, B, and C, and D, uh, the values here is gonna be zero or one. As an example, let's say that this uh, F is zero, zero, one, one. So what you do, you write zero, zero, one, one. Now you know that the function here, uh, in, in the last video, we say that we look at the ones and you can find the min terms. The first min term is x, y bar. And the second min term is x, y. So for this function, the one pair of adjacent cell containing one can be combined using the minimization uh, theorem and the Boolean algebra. And you can say that now you can get x as a common factor, y bar or y will be one, and you will end up with x. You can do that also in the Carnot map directly by combining those two together like this. And now you know that the y differ in those adjacent squares. So one time it was zero and the other time it was one. So you don't care about the value of y and x was stable the whole time. It was constant. It was always one, which means that the function is going to be x. Uh, if you have another function, let's say this one, 0, 1, 1, 1, you fill it in the Carnot map. And again, you can do the, uh, you find the uh, min terms or uh, finding the min terms, it's uh, gonna be x bar y or x, y, or x, y bar. So by finding the minimization technique, I notice that we uh, copy this two times uh, to make it easy to use Boolean uh, algebra. So we get the x as a factor here. We get the y as a factor here. So if we get the x, y bar or y will be one. If you get the y, x or x bar will be one and you end up with x or y. This is using the Boolean algebra. And we use the minimization theorem as you know it before. Now we can do the same thing to find x or y directly by using the Carnot map this way. You circle those two together, and this will give you x. You will circle those two together because they are adjacent. You can circle only adjacent squares. You can combine them only if they are adjacent. So you can do this, and it will be y. And you will put or between them because you have two different uh, groups and you get x or y, as you can see. So in, using Carnot map, it's fairly easy to get the minimum or the minimized function. Now for three variable uh, K map, the function here f has three variable, x, y, and z. You can see the truth table is here. And you have a function output a, b, c, d, e, f, g, and h. Now, to get the adjacent squares, it will be slightly different than the two-variable map. You can see here that the x, we make it 0 and 1. This is the most significant bit. So we make it 0 and 1 here. And then the other least, y and z, you make them this way. And you write down in the Carnot map, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then you will write 1, 1, and after that, 0, 1. So you will say 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1. 
to maintain the adjacent behavior. This is very important. And actually what we are doing here, we are trying to do uh, similar to the technique that we studied before in the gray coat. In the gray coat. So uh, we fill the Carnot map. If you start from A, you will say, okay, I'll write A here. After that, B. And then C will be here. Notice the jump. And then we will move back for the D. We also have the indexes here. 0, 1, 2, 3. To show this behavior of the three variable kernel map. And then you would say E, F, E, F. And then you will have G here. And then H over here. So you fill it this way, zero, one, or let me fill it again, A, B, and then C over here, and then D, E, F, and then G over here, and then H. It's very important to fill the, 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 the kernel map correctly. To do the uh, optimization skill in, the, in a correct way. Uh, as we said in the two variable Carnot map, here you have the min terms. For example, if you have uh, M4, M4 is going to be uh, X, Y bar, Z bar. And you can see it here, X, Y bar, and end it with Z bar. So each min term corresponds to the product term. Note that if the binary value for an index differ in, in one bit position, the min terms are adjacent on the kernel map. And this is why we have these jumps. Also, don't forget that when you number the, uh, or you add the bits for the uh, columns, you start it this way, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1. If we take this function, uh, the sum of min terms 2, 3, 4, and 5, and you fill it in the truth table here, to fill it inside the Carnot map, you would say, OK, I'll write 0, 0. You, you go from the first row down to the last one, and you fill it this way, 0, 0. And then this one will be here. And the other one here is, will be here. And after that, you will have 1, 1 here. This zero is here, and the last one is over here. And to optimize this, and we will have a, a, a certain rules that we will follow in a future slice to do the optimization in a correct way. But this is a quick, a quick way, so you understand that the optimization is fairly easy. Uh, you will circle those two together, and those two together. And you will say that the function f now is equal to x. x didn't change here. And you, you try to find which one of them stayed the same value without a change. And you can find that the y here is 0. So we have x, y bar. That's the first group. The second group is x bar, because it's x bar here. And the one that was constant is y. And this will be the optimized function. Instead of using the uh, sum of min terms, which will have a lot of laterals, and if you find the cost, it's going to be a lot in terms of l or g or gn. This is very, very simple compared to this one. Now, another example, if you have three, four, six, and seven, and basically you can fill it directly to the Carnot map without uh, filling the truth table because you have the indexes three, four, six, and seven, and you know their positions here in the Carnot map, it takes some practice to get it 
right away. So this is three, three will be here, four will be here, six will be here, and seven will be here. And then you will move to the optimization. Uh, but I prefer to do it in a formal way in the future slides. So you learn the location of the eight indexes based on the variable order shown that I showed to you in many slides. Now, how to combine the squares? By combining, combining squares, we reduce the number of literals in a product term, reducing the literal cost and thereby reducing the other two cost the, the other two cost criteria. On a three variable K map, a single square, one square, for example, this blue one, represents a min term with three variables. You can see that there are three values. If you combine two adjacent squares together, they will represent a product term with two variables. So if you combine those two, for example, you can see that the X and Y bar are, are constant here. So this the Z will sometimes, one time is Z bar here and another time here is Z. So we cross it out because we can take X, Y bar as a common factor and it will be the one that's left over. So it will represent a, a term with two variables, as you can see. If you combine four adjacent squares, this will get, give, give you a term with only a single variable. So the only uh, variable that is constant here is the y. Now, the maximum that you could combine in a three cardinal map is each adjacent term when you have ones all in all the squares. So you combine everything together. If you come, if you were able to combine everything together, then the function of, of them will be, is, uh, or that the resulting function will equal to one. So a three variable map can have rectangle corresponding to a single, one, which will give you three variable, two ones that are adjacent together, and this will give you two variables, four ones that are adjacent to each other, and those will give you one variable, and if the whole cardinal map is filled with ones, then you will get zero variable because you will result, or the function will result in the constant one. Now, as an example, if you have this function, the sum of min term two, three, six, and seven, if you were asked to fill the truth table, you know that this is two, this is three, this is six, and this is seven. And the min terms for each one of them is shown to you here. You can use the Boolean algebra to try to minimize this function, or you could use the Carnot map. If you fill it in the Carnot map, you fill it this way, you will start from here going down. So you will say zero, zero, and then this one will be here. This one will be here. And after that, you will have zero, zero. This one will be here. And this one will be here. And you can see that the four ones here are adjacent with each other. And you can group them together in a big rectangle or a big square. From that square, you could say that x here is not a constant, the z is not a constant, and the constant is y. The one that doesn't change is y. So the function is equal to y. So uh, you need to know which of these squares are adjacent. You must know this property to be able to use the kernel map for optimizing functions. A three variable map, a topological wrap, is actually a wrap of a three variable K map that shows all the adjacent squares. You can say, take this kernel map 
and you can wrap it with this direction here to get this cylinder shape. This cylinder shape is showing you all the adjacent squares. Some of the squares you can know that they are adjacent from the from the first look of the Carnot map. So this one and this one are adjacent. Those four, for example, are adjacent. Those four are adjacent. Those four here are adjacent. Those two are adjacent. Those two are adjacent and so on. But the one that you should worry about is the one at the edges because this square is actually an adjacent to this one because you can wrap the Carnot map or the, or the three variable Carnot map. And those two squares are also adjacent. So the zero and two are adjacent. The four and six are also adjacent. And if you have those two, if you have one and one here, for example, and you group those ones and the rest are zero, you'll group only those. Then here you will have X bar because the X here is constant. So you'll have X bar and you will have also Z bar. And this is what we mentioned here. For the other two here, it will generate X, Z bar. So now you know the adjacencies of all these squares. You can also represent the same thing using Venn diagram. So you have three variables, x, y, and z. Uh, you will have the number zero, the, end, the main term zero representing the outside space. The number one is only z, two only y, Number three is between Y and Z, but not including the X. Number four is only X. Number five, between X and Z, but not including the Y. Number six, between X and Y, but not including the Z. And the last one is when you have all the three variables together. So from this Venn diagram, you know the adjacencies as well. You know that, for example, 0 is adjacent to 4, 2, and 1. And here is the same. 0 is adjacent to 1, 4, and also 2. For example, 7. 7 is adjacent to 3, 5, and 6. So the 7 is adjacent to 3, 5, and 6. If you take, for example, 2, 2 is adjacent to 6, 3, and 0. So that's the 6. It's adjacent to 2, uh, 4, and 7. Uh, I, I think I, I mentioned 2 here. So if we check 2, 2, the, the adjacent of 2 is 3, 6, and 0. So it's here, 2, 3 is adjacent, 6 is adjacent, and also 0 is adjacent. So I recommend using the cylinder shape. It's very clear to you, I think. Now, uh, to give you more examples and to practice yourself, you can see some of the uh, two cell rectangulars that, that, that represent uh, two adjacent squares. So you have this red one, the purple one, the uh, light blue one, and also the light green one. And the product one for each one of them is shown to you here. Uh, also the four cell rectangulars, if you have the green, the light green, or the red one, the purple, or the light blue, you, can, you, you have to notice this blue one. If you try to uh, get, if you have one, one, one one here so you group those ones together and your result the, the result here is z bar so you can practice the similar in the similar way that we just mentioned let's me take another example for you for example this purple the purple one is this one and in the purple one you have x constant and y and z are changing so it will represent x 
you can see that the big squares here with that I have four squares generating a, a term with only one variable. While if you have only two squares together, so it will ge generate a term with two variables. So you can uh, actually uh, uh, challenge your friend as a game and uh, uh, maybe show him some grooving and uh, let him find those product terms and score yourself to find how many correct terms you get. Uh, three variable maps. And the K map can be used to simplify Boolean function, as we said. The term are selectors to cover the ones in the map. And you could simplify, for example, this function. If you use the truth table or you fill it directly in the Carno map, one, two, three, four, five, and seven. This is one, two, three, five, and seven. To do the simplification in a correct way, you ask yourself, can I group uh, ones that are adjacent with the biggest possible square? So first, can you get all the squares, all the eight squares together? You can't because there are zeros. Can you group four together? You will find those four together that you can group them because they are adjacent. Now, if you group those together, there is one left over here. You don't take it by itself. You try to get the biggest possible adjacent or, or the biggest possible rectangular that can uh, group adjacent ones together. So the biggest one is this one here, which is having two variables. So this will generate a term for you, and this will generate another term. The term that this uh, rectangle or the, this square is generating for you is the x is changing. The one that is constant is z. And for this small one, you have x bar and y. And this is the symbol the simplest form of this function. You can see that the optimization is easier than applying Boolean algebraic loads. If you were asked to use a curve map to find the optimum uh, SOP equation for this function that has those min terms, now we have many min terms, you fill them in the Carnot map first, by saying this is zero, one, two, you don't have a three, four, you don't have a five, six, and then seven. Don't forget that the six comes here and the seven over here. So we're making the jump, if you remember. After you fill the kernel map, you ask the same question. Can you get eight? squares together? No, you can't because you have zeros. Can you get four together? You might miss the edges. Always think about the edges. So you can see that you have one, one, and then the other edge you have one and one. You can group those four together. And you left with those two ones, you can include them this way. One over here and the other over here. This is the biggest rectangular possible to cover both ones. So you'll end up with three terms. The first one is z bar for the biggest square. And you can see that the one that was constant is the z bar. For this one, it's gonna be x bar, y bar. For this one, it's gonna be x, y. So this way we simplify, simplify this function. For a four variable Carnot map, this is the truth table. And if you have from A up to P, A, B, C, D up to P, you fill them in a four 
variable Carnot map this way. First, you generate the Carnot map this way. The easiest way to draw it is by drawing one line over here, another line over here, and then you divide this into two, you divide this into two, and you do the similar thing here. You divide those into two and those into two, and then you close the four variable k map. This is the easiest way to draw it without a ruler. After that, you write the function name over here. And then you would write the variables this way, starting from the most significant, w, x, y, and z. And then you would say 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 1. Similarly here, 0, 0. 1, 0, 1, 1, and 0, 1. And after that, you fill the, uh, the output with its variable, uh, I, mean, I mean with its uh, zeros and ones inside the Carnot map. The way to fill it is, as you see here, this is the indexes starting from 0, 0, 1, and then you jump over here, 2 and 3, this jump is similar to what we faced in the uh, three variable kernel map. And then you will go to the second row, four, five, six, and then seven. And here, the special uh, 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 point about the four variable map is the jump from the second to the last row. So after you have seven here, seven here, you will have eight, nine, and then 10, and then you will go back to 11, and then you will continue back 12, 13, 14, 15. I will fill it quickly here. This is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, look at the jump here, J, K, L, M, N, then O and P. You fill it this way. And the respective min terms are filled over here. So for example, if we take 13, we know that 13 is W, X, Y bar, Z, W, X, Y bar, Z, and so on. You can find the other min term. For example, if you have this function, being the summation of the min terms 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 13, and 15. Then you will write it this way. You will have 0. You will have 2, 4, 5, 6, and then 7. You have 8. You don't have 9. And then 10. You don't have 11. And then you jump here, there is no 12. And then 13, you don't have 14, and the last is 50. After you fill the Carnot map with zeros and ones, you actually, you don't have to fill the zeros. You can uh, just fill it with ones and leave the zeros blank. And if you like, you can add the zeros as I did it. And after that, you ask yourself the same question that we asked in the th three variable. Uh, what is the biggest square that you can include neighboring uh, uh, neighboring squares or adjacent squares? So the largest one is 16. Since you have zeros, you cannot get 16. Can you get eight together? You will try to find eight together. You can't. And then you will find that you can get those four together and this four together. Now a very special, you, you also need to worry about the edges. The edges all over the four variable corner map. The edges here are adjacent to the edges here. The edges here 
are adjacent to the edges over here. And one special four uh, squares that are adjacent together are the corners. If you have one, one, and one, and one, you include them together as adjacent in a bigger group. Uh, after you do this, you can find the simplified version of this function easily by finding which variable is doesn't change. So you can see here in this square, it's going to be w bar x. And for this square, it's going to be x z. And for the corner case, it's going to be, if you check this, it will be x bar, and you will check those two. The constant one is z bar. So it's going to be x bar, z bar, and then you order them together. And this is the simplified form of this function. Similar to the third order to the three variable kernel map, on a four variable k map, one square represents a min term with four variables. So if you have a min term with a, a single square, it will have four variables, as the blue one here. If you have two adjacent terms, it will give you three variables, like this one. If you have four adjacent, it will give you only two variables, and it goes down. If you have eight adjacent terms, it will be only one variable. And if you have the whole kernel map, which is 16, then you have zero variables because the function is equal to one. As you can see, if you go from here, one, two, four, eight, and 16, the number of variables start as four, and then it goes down four, three, two, one, and then zero. So a single one will give you four variable. If you have two adjacent ones, it will give you three variables, four adjacent ones, two variables, eight adjacent ones, one variable, the whole kernel map, it will give you no variables at zero variables because the resulting function is going to be equal to one. Here are some examples for the for level for uh, uh, variable. K map. So if you have those two, notice that we have adjacents in the edges here. It's going to be W bar, X bar, Z bar. Let me do this for you. W bar, this is W bar, it's a constant. X bar is a constant. And the constant one here is the Z bar. You can do the other ones. Similarly here, if we take the uh, red one here, it's going to be W bar and Y, W bar, Y. For the eight cell rectangle, and notice the edges here, we have the edges over here. So if you have one, 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 and one, 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 a common mistake is to group those four together and those four together. No, that's not correct you should get the biggest square or rectangular possible that you could include all the adjacent squares together. And this will be the red one. And you can see that the constant variable here is the, I mean, the constant lateral is the z bar. Uh, just to remind you again, if you have ones in the corners, don't forget it. You can include them together and it will generate X bar, Z bar. Now, to know the adjacent, the adjacency, how the adjacency of the four variable K map, remember the three, carry, the three variable K map, we get a cylinder shape. Now here, what will, will happen is we will move the Carnot map to this direction, and then we'll try to uh, wrap it this way. If you wrap it, you will get the cylinder shape, and then 
try to connect the two to the zero and the 14 to the 12, and you will get this donut shape. If you get this donut shape, you can notice now this red point or the red line here is actually the edge that you have here. You'll notice that, for example, one, five, four, and zero are adjacent together. One, five, four, and zeros are adjacent together. The edges, which is zero, two, 10, and also eight, these are the corners. Now, clearly they are adjacent together. For example, remember if you have those four together with those four, you'll see that zero, four, 12, and eight, zero, four, 12, and eight, they are adjacent together. You can see they are going this way. Okay, when you wrap this donut. And also two, six, 14, and 10. Two, six, 10, and also 14, but 14 is not shown because it's in the back. Uh, that's the adjacencies in the fork cardinal map. Uh, you don't have to draw the donut every time you're trying to do optimization. This will be enough. Like this, and try to practice these to make sure that you know the adjacencies. Uh, now we will do the systematic simplification. We have done it in so many examples so far, but we will give them some names, some terminologies, so uh, uh, you know exactly how to call them. Uh, so we will introduce to you an implicant. An implicant is the rectangle on a map made up of squares containing ones. So if you have a single square, two squares together, four squares together, uh, or uh, eight squares together, or 16 squares together, they are all could be, or all of them could be called implicant. Now there are special cases of those implicants that are called brine implicant. A brine implicant is a product term obtained by combining the maximum possible number of adjacent squares in the map into a rectangle with the number of squares that represent a power of two. So first, you try to get 16 together. If you can't, try to get eight together. If you can't, get four together, starting from the highest to get the maximum possible number of ones that you can group together. If you get the maximum, you can call it a prime implicant. Now, out of this group, if you get all the prime applicants, there is a special, a more special group called essential prime applicant. So if there is a prime applicant, we could call it an essential prime applicant if it is the only prime applicant that cover or include a certain one or a certain Min term. If there is a one in the Carnot map that is not covered by any uh, implicant but one, that implicant will be a prime implicant and it will be also essential prime implicant. Now, prime implicants and essential prime implicants can be determined by inspecting the Carnot map. A set of prime applicants that covers all the min terms uh, for each min term of this function, at least one prime applicant in the set of the prime applicants will include this min term. And to understand this, we will apply it here in this function. An example of a, uh, a prime applicant, as you can see here, if you were asked to find all the prime applicants for this function, this function f have the summation of min terms 0, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, and 15. You will fill it in the 
four variable came up as we explained before. Now, if you were uh, asked to find all the prime applicants, then you will try to find the adjacencies, but starting from the biggest possible grouping. So you will notice that you cannot get A together here, but you can get those four together in the yellow one. And I write what term that it's corresponding to it. You can group those four together. Notice I always worry about the edges. Check the edges one and two times. So those four together will give you this term. The red one will give this you, will give you this. And the purple one here, it will give you this one. And the light blue one will give you this one. So we got six prime applicants. Six prime applicants. And we covered all the uh, ones. Also, don't forget the corners. In this function, we have the corners, which is x bar, z bar. Now, among those, there are some of them that are essential. Sometimes you find some of them essential. Sometimes you can't find any essential. The essential ones will be the one that covers uh, a certain one in the kernel map and nobody else covered it. So for example, the purple one here, it's going to be essential because you, you see this one is only covered by the purple one. This one could be covered by the red one or the purple one. This one could be covered by the light blue or the purple. This one also by the light blue or the dark. But this one here makes the purple square and essential prime. So this one going to be an essential prime applicant. If you try to find if the yellow one here is essential, you could you, you should check each one of them. So if you check the yellow one, uh, this one is covered by two of them, so it doesn't help. It's covered by two, the light blue and the yellow. This one is covered by many, the red, the green, the yellow. Uh, this one is covered by the light blue, green, and the yellow. So the yellow term or the yellow rectangle is not an essential prime amplicate. It's sim a simple prime amplicate. Or we just call it prime amplicate. You check the other ones as well. You will only find another essential prime amplicate, which is the light blue one. Because you have this one that is only covered by the light blue one. And because of this, we call it an essential prime amplicate. And this is what we mean by uh, the, uh, this point, a prime applicant is called an essential prime applicant if it is the only prime applicant that covers or, or includes one or more main terms. Now, after this, you, ca you could optimize the function this way. You would say f is equal to, first you include the essential prime amplicate, which is x, z, or x bar, z bar. If you include the essential prime amplicate, these ones will be covered. Now, the leftover is this one, this one, and this one. Try to get the minimum number of prime amplicates that cover the leftover of the ones. So you can say that if you include the red one, the red one will cover those. If you include the red one, and if you include the yellow one, it will cover this. So we will include two more prime applicants. The essential will be always there. And then from the prime applicants, sometimes there are variation. You could include uh, different prime applicants and they will work. But for this one, you will include the, yellow, the red one, which is YZ. And 
you will also include the yellow one, which is W x bar. And this way we make the simple form of this function. Now going back, a set of prime applicants that covers all the min terms, if for each min term of the function, at least one prime applicant in the set of the prime applicants include that min term. Now, if you, that's not, this is another exercise. If you were asked to find all the prime applicants of this function, you will fill it in the Carnot map. And you can see uh, from the get-go, those eight together. And you get the corners. Worry always about the edges. Also, the corners is the light blue. And you have the green one. And those are the only three prime applicants. If you were asked which one of them is essential, the red one is essential. Look how many ones is covered by the red one only. So the red one is essential. You have one, two, three, four, five ones that only included in this red rectangle. The green one is also essential because of this one. And the blue, light blue is essential because of this one. So those three are prime and prime applicant. They are also essential prime applicants. Now, at this point, you know how to optimize functions. But now we will introduce another, uh, introduce another concept that makes the uh, optimization even uh, worthwhile. So we will introduce the don't cares in the k-maps. Sometimes a function table or a truth table uh, or a Carnot map contains entries in which it is known the input values for the min term will never occur or the output value for the min term is not used. So in those cases, we actually either we don't care about the input or we don't care about the output. So that in these cases, the output value need not to be defined. Instead, the output value is defined as don't care. And we will have a sample for don't cares, which is an x. x. So an x entry in the function table or in the Carnot map, the cost of the logic circuits, it will be lowered by taking advantage of those x's. Since we don't care about them, we can assign them to be one or zero. Most of the time we will assign them to be one to make use of them in the optimization. As an example, a logic function having the binary code for the BCD digit as its input. Only the codes from zero to nine are used. And we mentioned the BCD code in a previous video. So only the code of zero and nine are used. The six more code starting from zero, one, zero, one, up to one, 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 they never occur. And because of this, we say that they are don't care. Another example, if you have a circuit that represents a very common situation that occurs in computer design, which has two distinct sets of input variables. So let's say A, B, and C, which takes on all possible combinations, and Y, which takes on values 0 or 1. Let's say that a single output, you have a single output, which is Z. The circuit that receives the output Z, this is like, I'm, I'm telling you the questions. It, it has a certain requirement. This circuit, receives the output Z and observes it only if, if A and B and C is equal to 1, 1, 1. And otherwise, it ignores it. Thus, Z is specified only for the combination A, B, C, Y equals to 1, 1, 1 or uh, 0, 1, 1, 1 and 1, 1, 1, 0. Those are the only two combinations that this uh, kid cares about. So the others will be don't. For these two combinations, 
z is equal to y. For all of the 14 remaining input combination, z is actually a dot. Ultimately, each x entry may take on either z or on one. We can set it up to zero or one to uh, make your uh, solution uh, easier. And usually we assign them to be one. To see an example, the map below gives a function f1, which has four variables. It's defining as five or more. It tells you this is a BCD, which has a special uh, rule. It's five or more. So uh, that's what, what the function uh, requires. With the don't cares, we used it for the other six not possible combinations. So F1 will have this function. So what happens is we will fill the uh, Carnot map this way. Since the BCD is five or more, we care about the five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So we fill those with one. Anything less than five will be zero because this is the requirement of the question. Now, what about 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15? Because those codes are not represented, we can say that they are don't care. We can say that they are don't care. And because of this, now the don't care can help us in the optimization. Because now I can say that this is a red uh, rectangle that covers all the, the ones with the don't cares. And you have also the purple, purple and the light blue to cover those two ones with don't cares, those two ones with the don't cares below them. And because of that, you get from the red one, W, you will get, get from the light blue, X, um, Z, and you will get from the purple, uh, X, and what? Because you are taking advantage of this, don't care. Now, if you want to try to find the cost, you will count the laterals, one, two, three, four, five, plus how many terms? Two, you ignore this because it's only a single. So plus two is equal to seven. So this is a much lower in cost than uh, a function where the don't cares were, were not or were treated as zero. So if you skip the don't care and or you consider them as zero, you cannot have this simple equation. So what happens in that case, you will get those two together and you will get those two together, and then you will get those two together. If you didn't consider the don't care. And because of this, you will get three terms here, three terms, I mean, three literal, you will get one term, but with three variables, one term with three variables here, and one term with three variables, and those are the three terms. The cost will be 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So this means if you use the don't care, it helps you in the minimization. Now, to formulate the optimization algorithm, this is the steps that we mentioned to you before. So what you do, you do, you find all the prime amplicants first, and then you include all the essential prime amplicants in the solution. Once you're done with the prime, so the, uh, the essential prime amplicants, you will you might find ones that are not included yet. So you select the minimum cost set of non-essential prime amplicants to cover all the remaining mentors. So uh, obtaining 
uh, an uh, optimum solution or obtaining a good simplified solution, you use the prime implicant selection rule. To have those, you use the prime implicant selection rule, which is what we mentioned before. You minimize the overlap among the prime implicant as much as possible. So you get as minimum of the prime implicant as possible. In particular, in the final solution, make sure that each prime applicant selected includes at least one midterm not included in any other prime applicants that were selected before. And this way you do the optimization. So just so you know how to apply this, we applied it in many examples before already. If you were asked to simplify this function, 0, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 13. You put the corresponding ones for those uh, squares, and then you get all the prime applicants. I, I generated the prime applicants already. This is one prime applicant, another prime applicant here. I tried to get eight, I couldn't. I tried to get four. This is the only one that I get, four together. This is two. This is a two together, those two together, those two together, and this one with the one here together, and those two together. You will notice that this one, because of this one, it's essential. Also, this one is essential. So those two must be in the final result of the function. This one being uh, A bar B. It's essential. And this one will be uh, a bar. Uh, it will be a bar C B. A bar C B. Those two are the essential. Now, since you pick those the essential first, now you are left with many other ones. You are left with this one, this one, this one, and this one. And you need to choose from many prime implicants. Which one to choose? Try to get the minimum number of prime implicants that cover the remaining ones. So we choose this one because it covered those two, and this one because it's covered the other two that were not kept. This one will be A bar. Uh, I mean A, it'll be A, C bar D, and this one here will be B bar C bar D. This is how you do the simplification using the selection group. Now, if you were, this is another example uh, with don't care. So what happens here is you try to do the similar thing for this function. Let's say that we already have the ones in the carnoma and we also have the don't care on this function. So here you have those four together. You will have those four together. Notice that we are making use of the don't care. You have those two with those two, grouping four together, four squared together. And you go, got this one with this one, and you can have this one. Now here, this one, uh, you might consider it as a prime applicant, or you don't. Uh, personally, I, I should uh, I don't like to include this one because it's not including a one; it's including a don't care. So this one with this one is enough. You shouldn't have this square. Some other books included and considered the brand applicant. Uh, for our case, we are not gonna do that. So uh, this is not a prime applicant because it's including a don't care that you are not making any use of it. Now to do this, uh, uh, now to have the function, you will get the uh, essential prime applicant first, and you will notice that this one is essential. So you'll get this one. And since you have this one as essential, if you try to find any other essential, it's only gonna be this one. 
Now you are left with this one, this one, and this one. You can get this one and the edges to cover those ones, those two ones here. So you'll get this rectangle, or let's say that this grouping. And you are left with the last one here. You can use this two ones here. And you consider it to be the prime amplicate. Another person could say, no, I'll use this one. If you use this one, it's going to be OK, instead of this one. But you cannot use both. And because you have four different grouping, you will have four. I mean, you have three different grouping, you will have three terms in the function f. Now, uh, We'll see more examples to uh, make sure that you understand the concept of the optimization. Uh, this is a product of some example, and you were asked to find the optimal POS solution for this function, 1, 3, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, if you use this function directly, you will have many ones in the kernel map. So as a hint, you could use f bar, which is the complement of this function, and then uh, get try to get the other. Uh, so after filling the kernel map with f bar, you will uh, make use of the properties that you studied before to generate f by moving from uh, the, uh, sum of product to product of sum. To do this, uh, I will leave the original form to you uh, by trying to get the uh, kernel map for this function, 1, 3, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and then try to optimize the function using this f. What I did here, I, I make use of this. Since we have many terms in the F, if we took the complement, it will have the summation of the min terms of the remaining indexes, 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10. I fill those 0, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 10, and then I optimize them. To optimize them, I have those four together, and I have the corners, and this will be, uh, the corners will be B bar and D bar, and this one will be A bar B, as you can see here. This now, since I got the F bar, this is the function of F bar. To get the function of f, simply apply Carnot uh, uh, apply De Morgan law, or try to get the product of sums. So the product of sums here is b or d, and did with a or b bar. And this way we did the simplification easier. Uh, uh, now we will move to the odd and even function and how are they generated in the Carnot map uh, along with other uh, uh, methods of, uh, uh, of simplifications to generate a, a much simpler form of the function, but we will discuss them in another video.